Warhammer 40,000 The Horus Heresy Book 1 Horus Rising, The Seeds of Heresy Are Sown Part 1 The Deceived 8 One-Way War Cinderman in Grass and Sand Jubal Following the Emperor's death and the fall of their ancient, centralized government, the insurgents had fled into the mountain massifs of the southern hemisphere, and occupied a fastness in a range of peaks, called the Whisperheads in the local language. The air was thin, for the altitude was very great. Dawn was coming up, and the mountains loomed as stern, misty steeples of pale green ice that reflected sun glare. The stormbirds dropped from the edge of space, out of the sky's dark blue mantle, trailing golden fire from their ablative surfaces. In the frugal habitations and villages in the foothills, the townsfolk, born into a culture of myth and superstition, saw the fiery marks in the dawn sky as an omen. Many fell to wailing and lamenting, or hurried to their village fanes. The religious faith of 6319, strong in the capital and the major cities, was distilled here into a more potent brew. These were impoverished backwaters, where the anachronistic beliefs of the society were heightened by a subsistence lifestyle and poor education. The imperial army had already straggled to contain this primitive zealotry during its occupation. As the streaks of fire crossed the sky, they found themselves hard-pressed to control the mounting agitation in the villages. The stormbirds set down, engines screaming, on a plateau of dry, white lava rock 5,000 meters below the caps of the highest peaks where the rebel fastness lay. They whirled up clouds of pumice grit from their jets as they crunched in. The sky was white, and the peaks were white against them, and white cloud softened the air. A series of precipitous rifts and ice canyons dropped away behind the plateau, wreathed in smoke cloud, and the lower peaks gleamed in the rising light. Tenth Company clattered out into the sparse, chilly air, weapons ready. They came to martial order, and disembarked as smoothly as Loken could have wished. But the Vox was still disturbed. Every few minutes, Samus chattered again, like a sigh upon the mountain wind. Loken called the senior squad leaders to him as soon as he had landed, Vipus of Locasta, Jubal of Hellebore, Rasik of the Terminator Squad, Talonis of Pithres, Kyrus of Valkyr, and eight more. All grouped around, showing deference to Xavier Jubal. Loken, who had always read men well as a commander, needed none of his honed leadership skills to realize that Jubal wasn't wearing Vipus's elevation well. As the others of the Mournival had advised him, Loken had followed his gut and appointed Nero Vipus his proxy commander, to serve when matters of state drew Loken apart from 10th. Vipus was popular, but Jubal, as sergeant of the first squad, felt slighted. There was no rule that stated the sergeant of a company's first squad automatically followed in seniority. The sequencing was simply a numerical distinction, but there was a given order to things, and Jubal felt aggrieved. He had told Loken so, several times. Loken remembered little Horace's words. If you trust Vipus, make it Vipus. Never compromise. Jubal's a big boy. He'll get over it. Let's do this, and quickly, Loken told his officers. The Terminators have the lead here. Rasik? My squad is ready to serve, Captain, Rasik replied curtly. Like all the men in his specialist squad, Sergeant Rasik wore the titanic armor of a Terminator, a variant only lately introduced into the arsenal of the Astartes. By dint of their primacy, and the fact that their primarch was Warmaster, the Luna Wolves had been amongst the first legion to benefit from the issue of Terminator Plate. Some entire legions still lacked it. The armor was designed for heavy assault. Thickly plated and consequently exaggerated in its dimensions, a Terminator suit turned an Astartes warrior into a slow, cumbersome, but entirely unstoppable humanoid tank. An Astartes clad in Terminator plate gave up all his speed, dexterity, agility, and range of movement. What he got in return was the ability to shrug off almost any ballistic attack. Rasik towered over them in his armor, dwarfing them as a Primarch dwarfs Astartes, or an Astartes dwarfs mortal men. Massive weapon systems were built into his shoulders, 
arms and gauntlets. Lead off to the bridges and clear the way, Loken said. He paused. Now was a moment for gentle diplomacy. Jubal, I want Hellebore to follow the Terminators in as the weight of the first strike. Jubal nodded, evidently pleased. The scowl of displeasure he had been wearing for weeks now lifted for a moment. All the officers were bareheaded for this briefing, despite the fact that the air was unbreathably thin by human standards. Their enhanced pulmonary systems didn't even labor. Loken saw Nero Vipus smile, and knew he understood the significance of this instruction. Loken was offering Jubal some measure of glory, to reassure him he was not forgotten. Let's go to it. Loken cried. Lupercal. Lupercal. The officers answered. They clamped their helms into place. Portions of the company began to move ahead towards the natural rock bridges and causeways that linked the plateau to the higher terrain. Army regiments, swaddled in heavy coats and rebreathers against the cold, thin air, had moved up onto the plateau to meet them from the town of Kasheri in the lower gorge. Kasheri is at compliance, sir, an officer told Loken, his voice muffled by his mask, his breathing pained and ragged. The enemy has withdrawn to the high fortress. Loken nodded, gazing up at the bright crags looming in the white light. We'll take it from here, he said. They're well armed, sir, the officer warned. Every time we've pushed to take the rock bridges, they've killed us with heavy cannon. We don't think they have much in the way of numerical weight, but they have the advantage of position. It's a slaughter ground, sir, and they have the cross draw on us. We understand the insurgents are being led by an invisible called Rikus or Riker. We will take it from here, Loken repeated. I don't need to know the name of the enemy before I kill him. He turned. Jubal. Vipus. Form up and move ahead. Just like that? The army officer asked sourly. Six weeks we've been here, slogging it out, the body toll like you wouldn't believe, and you. We're Astartes, Loken said. You're relieved. The officer shook his head with a sad laugh. He muttered something under his breath. Loken turned back and took a step towards the man, causing him to start an alarm. No man liked to see the stern isolates of a Luna Wolf's impassive visor turn to regard him. What did you say? Loken asked. I... I... nothing, sir. What did you say? I said. And the place is haunted, sir. If you believe this place is haunted, my friend, Loken said, then you are admitting to a belief in spirits and demons. I'm not, sir. I'm really not. I should think not, Loken said. We're not barbarians. All I mean, said the soldier breathlessly, his face flushed and sweaty behind his breather mask, is that there's something about this place. These mountains. They're called the Whisper Heads, and I've spoken to some of the locals in Kasheri. The name's old, sir. Really old. The locals believe that a man might hear voices out here, calling to him, when there's no one around. It's an old tale. Superstition. We know this world has temples and fanes. They are dark age in their beliefs. Bringing light to that ignorance is part of why we're here. So what are the voices, sir? What? Since we've been here, fighting our way up the valley, we've all heard them. I've heard them. Whispers. In the night, and sometimes in the bold brightness of day when there's no one about, and on the Vox too. Samus has been talking. Loken stared at the man. The oath of moment fixed to his shoulder plate fluttered in the mountain wind. Who is Samus? Damned if I know, the officer shrugged. All I know for certain is the whole Vox net has been loopy these past few days. Voices on the line, all saying the same thing. A threat. They're trying to scare us, Loken said. Well, it worked then, didn't it? Loken walked out across the plateau in the biting wind, between the parked stormbirds. 
Samus was muttering again, again, his voice a dry crackle in the background of Logan's open link. Samus. That's the only name you'll hear. I'm Samus. Samus is all around you. Samus is the man beside you. Samus will gnaw upon your bones. Loken was forced to admit the enemy propaganda was good. It was unsettling in its mystery and its whisper. It had probably been highly effective in the past against other nations and cultures on 6319. The Emperor had most likely come to global power on the basis of malignant whispers and invisible warriors. The Astartes of the true Emperor would not be gulled and unmanned by such simple tools. Some of the Luna wolves around him were standing still, listening to the mutter in their helm sets. Ignore it, Loken told them. It's just a game. Let's move in. Rasek's lumbering terminators approached the rock bridges, arches of granite and lava that linked the plateau to the fierce verticality of the peaks. These were natural spans left behind by the action of ancient glaciers. Corpses, some of them reduced to desiccated mummies by the altitude, littered the plateau shelf and the rock bridges. The officer had not been lying. Hundreds of army troopers had been cut down in the various attempts to storm the high fortresses. The field of fire had been so intense, their comrades had not been able even to retrieve their bodies. Advance. Advance. Loken ordered. Raising their storm bolters, the Terminator squad began to crunch out across the rock bridges, dislodging white bone and rotten tunics with their immense feet. Gunfire greeted them immediately, blistering down from invisible positions up in the crags. The shots spanked and wind off the specialized armor. Headset, the Terminators walked into it, shrugging it away, like men walking into a gale wind. What had kept the army at bay for weeks, and cost them dearly, merely tickled the Legion warriors. This would be over quickly, Loken realized. He regretted the loyal blood that had been wasted needlessly. This had always been a job for the Astartes. The front ranks of the Terminator squad, halfway across the bridges, began to fire. Bolters and inbuilt heavy weapon systems unloaded across the abyss, blitzing lost shots and storms of explosive munitions at the upper slopes. Hidden positions and fortifications exploded, and limp, tangled bodies tumbled away into the chasm below in flurries of rock and ice. Samus began his worrying again. Samus. That's the only name you'll hear. Samus. It means the end and the death. Samus. I am Samus. Samus is all around you. Samus is the man beside you. Samus will gnaw upon your bones. Look out! Samus is here. Advance! Loken cried, and please, someone, shut that bastard up. And who's Samus? Borodine Flora asked. The Remembrancers, with an escort of army troopers and servitors, had just disembarked from their lander into the bitter cold of a township called Kasheri. The cold mountains swooped up beyond them into the mist. The area had been securely occupied by Varvaris's troopers and war machines. The party stepped into the light, all of them giddy and breathless from the altitude. Healer was calibrating her picture against the harsh glare, trying to slow her desperate breath rate. She was annoyed. They'd set down in a safe zone, a long way back from the actual fighting area. There was nothing to see. They were being handled. The town was a bleak outcrop of longhouse longhouses in a lower gorge below the peaks. It looked like it hadn't changed much in centuries. There were opportunities for shots of rustic dwellings or parked army war machines, but nothing significant. The glaring light had a pure quality, though. There was a thin rain in it. Some of the servitors had been instructed to carry the Remembrancer's bags, but the rest were fighting to keep parasol canopies upright over the heads of the party in the crosswind. Healer felt they all looked like some idle gang of Aristos on a grand tour, exposing themselves not to risk but to some vague, stage-managed version of danger. Where are the Astartes? She asked. When do we approach the war zone? 
Never mind that, Flora interrupted. Who is Samus? Samus? Cinderman asked, puzzled. He had walked a short distance away from the group beside the lander into a scrubby stretch of white grass and sand, from where he could overlook the misty depth of the rain-swept gorge. He looked small, as if he was about to address the canyon as an audience. I keep hearing it, Flora insisted, following him. He was having trouble catching a breath. Flora wore an earplug so he could listen in to the military's Vox traffic. I heard it too, said one of the protection squad soldiers from behind his fogged rebreather. The Vox has been playing up, said another. All the way down to the surface, said the officer in charge. Ignore it. Interference. I've been told it's been happening for days here, Van Crossen said. It's nothing, said Cinderman. He looked pale and fragile, as if he might be about to faint from the airlessness. The captain says it's scare tactics, said one of the troopers. The captain is surely right, said Cinderman. He took out his data slate and connected it to the fleet archive base. As an afterthought, he uncoupled his rebreather mask and set it to his face, sucking in oxygen from the compact, compact tank strapped to his hip. After a few moments consultation, he said, Oh, that's interesting. What is? Asked Keeler. Nothing. It's nothing. The captain is right. Spread yourselves out, please, and look around. The soldiers here will be happy to answer any questions. Feel free to inspect the war machines. The remembrancers glanced at one another and began to disperse. Each one was followed by an obedient servitor with a parasol and a couple of grumpy soldiers. We might as well not have come, Keeler said. The mountains are splendid, Sark said. Bugger the mountains. Other worlds have mountains. Listen. They listened. A deep, distant booming rolled down the gorge to them. The sound of a war happening somewhere else. Keeler nodded in the direction of the noise. That's where we ought to be. I'm going to ask the iterator why we're stuck here. Best of luck, said Sark. Cinderman had walked away from the group to stand under the eaves of one of the mountain town's crude longhouse dwellings. He continued to study his slate. The mountain wind nodded the tusks of dry grass sprouting from the white sand around his feet. Rain pattered down. Keeler went over to him. Two soldiers and a servitor with a parasol began to follow her. She turned to face them. Don't bother, she said. They stopped in their tracks and allowed her to walk away, alone. By the time she reached the iterator, she was sucking on her own oxygen supply. Cinderman was entirely occupied with his data slate. She held off with her complaint for a moment, curious. There's something wrong, isn't there? She asked quietly. No, not at all, Cinderman said. You found out what Samus is, haven't you? He looked at her and smiled. Yes. You're very tenacious, Euphrati. Born that way. What is it, sir? Cinder Cinderman shrugged. It's silly, he said, showing her the screen of the data slate. The background history we've already been able to absorb from this world features the name Samus and the Whisper Heads. It seems this is a sacred place to the people of 6319. A holy, haunted place, where the alleged barrier between reality and the spirit world is at its most permeable. This is intriguing. I am endlessly fascinated by the belief systems and superstitions of primitive worlds. What does your slate tell you, sir? Keeler asked. It says, this is quite funny. I suppose it would be scary, if one actually believed in such things. It says that the Whisper Heads are the one place on this world where the spirits walk and speak. It mentions Samus as chief of those spirits. Local, and very ancient, legend, tells how one of the emperors battled and re-strained a nightmarish force of devilry here. The devil was called Samus. It is here in their myths, you see? We had one of our own, in the very antique days, 
called Satan or Tiamat. Samus is the equivalent. Samus is a spirit, then? Keeler whispered, feeling unpleasantly lightheaded. Yes. Why do you ask? Because, said Keeler, I've heard him hissing at me since the moment we touched down. And I don't have a vox. Beyond the rock bridges, the insurgents had raised shield walls of stone and metal. They had heavy cannons, cannons covering the gully approaches to their fortress, wired munition charges in the narrow defile, electrified razor wire, bolted storm doors, barricades of rock creep blocks and heavy iron poles. They had a few automated sentry devices, and the advantage of the sheer drop and unscalable ice all around. They had faith and their god on their side. They had held off Varvarus's regiments for six weeks. They had no chance whatsoever. Nothing they did even delayed the advance of the Luna Wolves. Shrugging off cannon rounds and the backwash of explosives, the Terminators wrenched their way through the shield walls and blasted down the storm doors. They crushed the spark of electric life out of the sentry drones with their mighty claws and pushed down the heaped barricades with their shoulders. The company flooded in behind them, firing their weapons into the rising smoke. The fortress itself had been built into the mountain peak. Some sections of roof and battlement were visible from outside, but most of the structure lay within, thickly armored by hundreds of meters of rock. The Luna Wolves poured in through the fortified gates. Assault squads rose up the mountain face on their jump packs and settled like flocks of white birds on the exposed roofs, ripping them apart to gain entry and drop in from above. Explosions ripped out the interior chambers of the fortress, opening them to the air, and sending rafts of dislodged ice and rock crashing down into the gorge. The interior was a maze of wet black rock tunnels and old tile work, through which the wind funneled so sharply it seemed to be hyperventilating. The bodies of the slain lay everywhere, slumped and twisted, sprawled and broken. Stepping over them, Loken pitted them. Their culture had deceived them into this resistance, and the resistance had brought down the wrath of the Astartes on their heads. They had all but invited a catastrophic doom. Terrible human screams echoed down the windy rock tunnels, punctuated by the door slam bangs of bolter fire. Loken hadn't even bothered to keep a tally of his kills. There was little glory in this, just duty. A surgical strike by the Emperor's martial instruments. Gun gunfire pinked off his armor, and he turned, without really thinking, and cut down his assailants. Two desperate men in mail shirts disintegrated under his fire and spattered across a wall. He couldn't understand why they were still fighting. If they'd ventured a surrender, he would have accepted it. That way, he ordered, and a squad moved up past him into the next series of chambers. As he followed them, a body on the floor at his feet stirred and moaned. The insurgent, smeared in his own blood and gravely wounded, looked up at Loken with glassy eyes. He whispered something. Loken knelt down and cradled his enemy's head in one massive hand. What did you say? Bless me, the man whispered. I can't. Please, say a prayer and commend me to the gods. I can't. There are no gods. Please, the other world will shun me if I die without a prayer. I'm sorry, Loken said, you're dying. That's all there is. Help me, the man gasped. Of course, Loken said. He drew his combat blade, the standard issue short, stabbing sword, and activated the power cell. The gray blade glowed with force. Loken cut down and sharply back up again in the mercy stroke, and gently set the man's detached head on the ground. The next chamber was vast and irregular. Meltwater trickled down from the black ceiling, and formed spurs of glistening mineral, like silver whiskers, on the rocks it ran over. A pool had been cut in the center of the chamber floor to collect the meltwater, probably as one of the fortress's primary water reserves. The squad he had sent on had come to a halt around its lip. Report, he said. One of the wolves looked round. What is this, Captain? He asked. 
Logan stepped forward to join them and saw that a great number of bottles and glass flasks had been set around the pool, many of them in the path of the trickling feed from above. At first, he assumed they were there to collect the water, but there were other items too, coins, brooches, strange doll-like figures of clay and the head bones, bones of small mammals and lizards. The spattering water fell across them, and had evidently done so for some time, for Loken could see that many of the bottles and other items were gleaming and distorted with mineral deposits. On the overhang of rock above the pool, ancient, eroded script had been chiseled. Loken couldn't read the words, and realized he didn't want to. There were symbols there that made him feel curiously uneasy. It's a feign, he said simply. You know what these locals are like. They believe in spirits, and these are offerings. The men glanced at one another, not really understanding. They believe in things that aren't real? Asked one. They've been deceived, Loken said. That's why we're here. Destroy this, he instructed, and turned away. The assault lasted 68 minutes, start to finish. By the end, the fastness was a smoking ruin, many sections of it blown wide to the fierce sunlight and mountain air. Not a single Luna wolf had been lost. Not a single insurgent had survived. How many? Loken asked Rasuk. They're still counting bodies, Captain, Rasuk replied. As it stands, 972. In the course of the assault, something in the region of 30 meltwater fanes had been discovered in the labyrinthine fortress, pools surrounded by offerings. Loken ordered them all expunged. They were guarding the last outpost of their faith, Nero Vipus remarked. I suppose so, Loken replied. You don't like it, do you, Garvey? Vipus asked. I hate to see men die, for no reason. I hate to see men give their lives like this, for nothing. For a belief in nothing. It sickens me. This is what we were once, Nero. Zealots, spiritualists, believers in lies we'd made up ourselves. The Emperor showed us the path out of that madness. So be of good humor that we've taken it, Vibus said. And, though we spill their blood, be phlegmatic that we're at last bringing truth to our lost brothers here. Loken nodded. I feel sorry for them, he said. They must be so scared. Of U.S.? Yes, of course, but that's not what I mean. Scared of the truth we bring. We're trying to teach them that there are no greater forces at work in the galaxy than light, gravity and human will. No wonder they cling to their gods and spirits. We're removing every last crutch of their ignorance. They felt safe until we came. Safe in the custody of the spirits that they believed watched over them. Safe in the ideal that there was an afterlife, an other world. They thought they would be immortal, beyond flesh. Now they have met real immortals, Vipus quipped. It's a hard lesson, but they'll be better for it in the long run. Loken shrugged. I just empathize, I suppose. Their lives were comforted by mysteries, and we've taken that comfort away. All we can show them is a hard and unforgiving reality in which their lives are brief and without higher purpose. Speaking of higher purpose, Vipus said, you should signal the fleet and tell them we're done. The iterators have voxed us. They request permission to bring the observers up to the site here. Grant it. I'll signal the fleet, fleet, and give them the good news. Vipus turned away, then halted. At least that voice shut up, he said. Loken nodded. Samus had quit his maudlin ramblings half an hour since, though the assault had failed to identify any Vox system or broadcast device. Loken's intervox crackled. Captain? Jubal? Go ahead. Captain, I'm... What? You're what? Say again, Jubal. Sorry, Captain. I need you to see this. I'm... I mean, I need you to see this. It's Samus. What? Jubal, where are you? Follow my locator. I've found something. 
I'm... I found something. Samus. It means the end and the death. What have you found, Jubal? I'm... I've found... Captain, Samus is here. Loken left Vipus to orchestrate the cleanup, and descended into the bowels of the fastness with Seventh Squad, following the pip of Jubal's locator. Seventh Squad, Breakspur Tactical Squad, was commanded by Sergeant Udon, one of Loken's most reliable warriors. The locator led them down to a massive stone well in the very basement of the fortress, deep in the heart of the mountain. They gained access to it via a corroded iron gate built into a niche in the dark stone. The dank chamber beyond the gate was a natural, vertical split in the mountain rock, a slanting cavern that overlooked a deep fault where only blackness could be detected. A pier of old stone steps arced out over the abyss, which dropped away into the very bottom of the mountain. Meltwater sprinkled down the glistening walls of the cavern well. The wind whined through invisible fissures and vents. Xavier Jubal was alone at the edge of the drop. As Loken and Seventh Squad approached, Loken wondered where the rest of Hellebore had gone. Xavier? Loken called. Jubal looked around. Captain, he said. I've found something wonderful. What? See? Jubal said. See the words? Loken stared where Jubal was pointing. All he saw was water streaming down a calcified buttress of rock. No. What words? There. There. I see only water, Loken said. Falling water. Yes, yes. It's written in the water. In the falling water. There and gone, there and gone, you see? It makes words and they stream away, but the words come back. Xavier? Are you well? I'm concerned that. Look, Garviel. Look at the words. Can't you hear the water speaking? Speaking? Drip, drip, drop. One name. Samus. That's the only name you'll hear. Samus? Samus. It means the end and the death. I'm... Loken looked at Udon and the men. Restrain him, he said quietly. Udon nodded. He and four of his men slung their bolters and stepped forward. What are you doing? Jubal laughed. Are you threatening me? For Terra's sake, Garviel, can't you see? Samus is all around you. Where's Hellebore, Jubal? Loken snapped. Where's the rest of your squad? Jubal shrugged. They didn't see it either, he said, and glanced towards the edge of the precipice. They couldn't see, I suppose. It's so clear to me. Samus is the man beside you. Udon, Loken nodded. Udon moved towards Jubal. Let's go, brother, he said, kindly. Jubal's bolter came up very suddenly. There was no warning. He shot Udon in the face, blowing gore and pulverized skull fragments out through the back of Udon's exploded helm. Udon fell on his face. Two of his men lunged forward, and the bolter roared again, punching holes in their chest plates and throwing them over onto their backs. Jubal's visor swung to look at Loken. I'm Samus, he said, chuckling. Look out! Samus is here.